Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. Can somebody just confirm for me that you can hear me adequately? We hear you very well, Michael. Thank you very much, Aristea. Okay, so um, welcome, everybody. My name is Professor Michael Gasiorek. Um, I'm an international trade economist, um, having done work on international trade, both theoretical and empirical, over very, very many years. And I'm director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. In June of this year, the UK TPO marked five years of activity as it was established immediately after the Brexit referendum. And I guess our aim, and many of you will be very familiar with what we do in the UK TPO, some of you perhaps slightly less so, so let me just spend one minute on this. I guess our aim is to bring objective, independent, rigorous analysis to trade policy making. And how do we do this? We do this through undertaking primary research, engaging extensively with government departments and stakeholders, and in terms of lots of different types of outputs. We publish and produce regular briefing papers, blogs, podcasts, animated videos, and webinars such as this. Please do take a look at our website if you're interested in trade policy, and of course, in UK trade policy. Today's webinar is a really good sort of example or manifestation of this. Perhaps very slightly unusually, this webinar is based on a pair of briefing papers, both of which focus on the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP for short. So, I am delighted to welcome Minika Marita Yeager, who's a Senior Policy Research Fellow at the UK TPO, and Emily Lydgate, a Deputy Director of the UK TPO and Senior Lecturer in Law at the University of Sussex, who will be presenting the work with regard to digital trade and food standards respectively, although in reverse order. I'm also really, really delighted to welcome as discussant David Hennig, who's Director of the UK Trade Policy Project at ESIT, the European Centre for Political Economy. David is an expert on trade, frequent commentator on UK trade policy, and indeed previously worked for trade or on trade for the UK government. So let me move on to today's webinar. Both briefing papers and the topic of today's discussion is centered around the CPTPP. And I guess there'll be two sets of issues, which I imagine we might end up exploring both in the presentations and then in the subsequent discussion. The first is what's in it for the UK, where the it is the CPTPP. But more broadly than that, what we're also really interested in, what the briefing papers discuss, are what are the wider ramifications and, impl and implications of CPTPP accession for the UK and in terms of the UK's regulatory approach and the examples of digital trade and food standards are two important and good ways of addressing this. The way we're going to organise this afternoon is I'm going to invite Emily to speak first for about 15 minutes, then Minico for about 15 minutes, and then David will act as discussant and commentator on the presentations and on the papers. And then I'll open it up for a general discussion to all of you who um, are hugely welcome as participants in this webinar. If you have questions, could I please ask you, can you post them in the Q&A as opposed to in the chat? So I will be trying to monitor as successfully as I can the Q&A session. And on that note, therefore, let me once again welcome Emily, Minico, and David, and hand over to Emily. Thanks very much. So can someone confirm that you can see my screen? And now we see your notes, Emily. We don't see it in full screen. Okay, just one second. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so hello, everyone. Um, so as as Michael was saying, um, I think the, the larger context for this event was really, you know, so we're free, you know, we've taken back control of our regulation and what happens next. Um, and obviously, trade policy plays a role in this. 
you know, a wise person once said that trade policy is domestic policy. And I think what interests us today is the extent to which the UK may be, um, in a sense, uh, looking outward to decide what we do uh, domestically. Um, and this all comes together with CPTPP, um, a big part of the UK's sort of post-Brexit strategy as the idea of the Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, you know, we, the most recent manifestation of this being um, Liz Truss's final trade secretary speech the day before yesterday, in which she said, we focus too much on trade in the EU, despite the richest opportunities being in the Asia Pacific. So the subtext is clearly, you know, don't worry about all these uh, trade barriers and customs barriers with the EU because we have even better opportunities elsewhere. So um, I think what Michael and I wanted to do in the first of the briefing papers we'll be looking at today is take this big question about the UK's sort of future direction and geopolitical alliances um, and look at it in the context of a specific trade agreement. Um, which of course has already been negotiated, so we don't have to speculate about what it contains um, and what it might mean for UK regulation in a specific area of agri-food, everyone's favorite uh, Brexit issue. Um, and there are sort of two questions that we pose within that. The first is, does CPTPP accession seem to suggest that we'll all be sort of swimming in toxic pesticides and chlorinated chicken? Um, anyone who's followed the Brexit debate, even from a distance, will know that this has been a huge source of controversy. So where does CPTPP leave us in this? And the second is, uh, does CPTPP prevent the UK from, say, a veterinary agreement where we basically agree to maintain agri-food alignment with the EU? So why this question? Well, uh, you know, the UK government has suggested that it can't have a veterinary agreement because of CPTPP and other FTAs. So we wanted to sort of interrogate this claim. Um, the short answer to both of these questions, not to leave you in suspense, um, is that like many things in trade law, they are open to interpretation. So, um, and, and probably the, inter the, the entities whose interpretation matters most are other CPTPP parties. So this is why we need to use the accession process strategically. So, um, and just um, a quick reminder that um, the UK government has said that it wants to maintain its current standards. Um, so this isn't something that we're sort of imposing on them. Um, so the first thing we wanted to look at in terms of standard or, or level of regulatory protection is tariffs. So um, the UK doesn't always require exporters to meet its uh, particular standards. So for example, with animal welfare, this came up quite a bit for those of you who follow this area in the, in the UK, Australia negotiations, so things like uh, prohibition of battery cages, sow stalls, hot branding, use of preventative antibiotics. These drive up production costs for UK producers um, and tariffs are a sort of a blunt tool to help level the playing field um, in these kind of areas. Um, some CPTPP parties have decided that they're going to maintain some protection of agriculture in sensitive areas through the use of so-called tariff rate quotas, which are a way of, um, sort of capping liberalization. So the UK could definitely um, use this approach. So we have, I, I put up one, one, one ex country example here of Japan. So this is the list of products that Japan has sort of ring fenced from um, CPTPP uh, total liberalization. So, um, you know, we don't know what the UK's tariff strategy will be, but that's something that it's going to have to address into the first stage of accession, accession negotiations. So um, we do know that the UK removed virtually all uh, tariffs and quotas in its uh, in agriculture, um, offering uh, so-called duty-free, quota-free access uh, for Australia. Um, but for Australia, at least this was reciprocal, right? So Australia also is offering us duty-free, quota-free access. If we do this for CPTPP, as the previous slide suggested, there's a possibility that we'll be offering this on a non-reciprocal basis. 
Um, a complicating factor here is that we already have bilateral deals with most of the CPTPP countries that have their own tariff schedules in them. But I think the point that, that we wanted to make is that um, unconditional tariff removal for all CPTPP members might put have the potential to put downward pressure on UK standards and that we should be alert to this um, when we make our tariff offer. So now we get to the fun part of uh, the standards controversy regulatory issues. So um, it's probably useful to uh, remember that CPTPP was initially an important part of the sort of foreign policy strategy of, of this guy here um, in the bottom right. Um, and in Obama, the Obama administration was actually the driving force behind the CPTPP's uh, so-called sanitary and phytosanitary standards chapter, which in layman's terms is, um, is the sort of the chapter dealing with food standards or more specifically human, animal and plant life and health. And actually, if you compare Trump era negotiating objectives for the UK free trade agreement with the CPTPP chapter, they're really, really similar. And this is something that we do in the briefing paper. Um, now, without getting into too much detail, uh, the crux of the, of the matter here is that the UK, like the EU, is somewhat of an international outlier in its uh, sort of precautionary approach to risk assessment. Um, and this has bothered the US and lots of other countries for a long time because they're facing product bans and restrictions. There's a pretty long list here. So it includes chlorinated chicken hormone treated beef, but it also includes pesticide active substances, types of novel food technologies, food additives, et cetera. So the US in particular is very against the precautionary approach and says that we should rely on international standards and a science-based approach. And this is how this shows up in CPTPP. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's ironic in a sense that after having so much controversy about a trade deal with the US, we're poised to sign up to pretty much the exact same set of obligations in CPTPP. Um, but there's still some uncertainty about how this will work in practice. So CPTPP members decided not to make this particular um, provision binding with dispute settlement. So what does that mean in practice? Well, a, a CPTPP country couldn't take the UK um, government to court in the, in the arbitral tri tri tribunal and say, um, hey, your maximum levels, residue levels for pesticides aren't based on Codex Alimentarius International Standards and they're completely unscientific. Um, but what they could do is put diplomatic pressure on the UK so they could say, hey, you signed up to science. What are you doing here? Um, what's going on with your pesticide regulation or, or, or other types of regulation? Um, and this really points to the importance of CPTPP accession negotiations to identify basically how upset are CPTPP members about UK SPS regulations, you know, and the first stage of CPTPP accession, of course, involves um, determining whether any UK regulation has to be changed to accommodate the agreement. So this is an opportunity for the UK to make clear that it doesn't see its precautionary approach as conflicting here. It doesn't see the CPTPP as grounds for changing its approach. Okay, so let's move on to the second question, which is basically, um, does CPTPP accession prevent the UK from um, continued regulatory alignment with the EU in the agri-food area? Uh, so what is the context for this? Well, um, one measure of our independence from the EU is that we have lots of new trade barriers. Um, and we're feeling this, of course, on the export side. Um, the import checks on agri-food haven't been introduced yet, but at the sharp end of these border checks is Northern Ireland, where we not only have the sort of economic cost of this intra-UK intra regulatory border, but we also have a set of uh, political security issues, which are fairly serious. So one potential solution endorsed by the Labour Party and others is that we agree to align our agri-food regulation temporarily um, to get rid of a lot of these border barriers. But Lord Frost says we can't do this because then we can't do FTAs. Um, so it, this suggests that we are making a decision here. You know, 
In other words, if you're with us, in this case, countries of the Pacific Rim, then you can't be with them, in this case, the EU. So there's a dichotomy. Um, so I think what this says about sort of the, the internal UK politics is quite interesting. Because if EU regulation would, would clash, you could say, well, this suggests that current UK regulation also clashes because we have more or less still the same regulation in, in most agri-food areas. So, and really the big difference between sort of EU approach and, and, and CPTPP approach is this politics of risk assessment. So this reliance on the, on the precautionary approach. So arguably there's some, you know, cause for concern here in the sense that we could say, you know, the UK government wants us to change our standards and move away from this approach because it sort of kills off the, the, the prospect of a veterinary agreement or, or long-term alignment with the EU. On the other hand, this could be sort of just purely rhetorical. So I think there's a really interesting question there. Um, and this brings me to um, our sort of recommendations um, that I think are really cross-cutting across both of these topics. Um, and what they really come down to is that we're acceding to this FTA, we're not negotiating it. Um, so we need to get what we want in the accession process. And that requires um, taking really careful stock of what our tariff offer will mean for agricultural industries and UK standards. Um, and it also means um, that we need to know whether CPTPP parties are um, interested in challenging our SPS regulation and our precautionary approach and being very clear uh, that we're not that that we're not going to change that, and that we reserve the right to um, raise our standards in the future. So side letters are one, um, effectively an opt out mechanism to CPTPP mechanisms, and that would be one way to do it. I'm happy to talk about that more in the Q and A because Minico and I have had a vigorous debate about the extent to which this would be possible, and I'd be interested in other views on that as well. Um, so the other point is that let's say, and this is eminently possible, by the way, it's certainly true for Australia in my, in my understanding, actually CPTPP parties don't really care about our SPS approach because they have other markets to serve and it's just not a big priority for, their, for them. So, um, you know, I think even if this is the case, then we should be wary. <laughs> about signing this in the sense that it's a different model of FTA than, than we've negotiated uh, or sort of rolled over thus far. Um, and if we're looking to future negotiations, if we're thinking about a negotiation with say Brazil or India, big, big ag exporters, they can point to this and say, you know, we have no grounds to avoid agreeing the same thing, um, whether it be tariff removal or, or changing our risk assessment approach um, in future FTAs. Um, so, and of course, these recommendations presuppose that we are going into CPTPP negotiations with a clearly defined strategy that involves um, maintaining our current food standards, not that we are sort of going to be blown in the wind by what the trade partners we encounter because we don't have a clearly defined strategy. Um, and I think that will be a very good segue to uh, Minico's uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Emily. That was great. Really, really fascinating and interesting. Let me hand over straight away to Minico, and then after that, I'll invite David to speak. Thank you so much, Michael, and then, um, hello to everybody. Uh, first of all, let me just share a screen with you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Emily, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, so my briefing paper examined the UK's policy journey on this uh, trade through creating or joining FTAs in some important areas and identified the major policy challenges of joining the CPTPP. So the quickly, um, I said what I'm going to explain. Uh, it's um, that we'll first introduce and then 
we look at the digital policy divergence at the global level, and the next we look at the UK's digital trade policy and where to go, and then we identify challenges joining the CPTPP, and I conclude. Um, so data-driven economy is a key for success modern economy, and data is become a major policy focus for economic prosperity of a country. So differences in domestic policy approaches causes economic and social uncertainty. This is why global digital trade governance is become a very important area. And the digital chapters and FTAs cover many issues, um, such as cross-border data flows, source code, data localization, data protection, consumer protection, and um, unsolicited cited the commercial electronic messages, non-political customer duties, and so on. So FTAs are playing a role in cooperation on digital trade and data governance. This is the reality. So as you know, um, the major players in the global digital economy are the US and China. For example, 90% of market capitalization value of the world's 70 largest digital platforms are dominated by these two countries, while Europe's share accounts for only 4%. Together with market influence, understanding the landscape of different regulatory approaches is very important. So broadly speaking, um, there are three major policies, approaches to digital policy, the US approach, the E approach and the Chinese approach. So the UK takes a more market driven, open rules approach in which data regarded as commercial assets. So there is no integrated data privacy law at the federal level, on the other hand. In contrast, the EU puts greater priority on public policy objectives, such as high level of consumer and private data protection and uh, competition policy in developing its digital policy. Um, also, my briefing paper does not describe the Chinese approach. Uh, China's model is state-led digital governance with a strong notion of data sovereignty, such as the data localization requirement. Over the last several years, China is intensifying movement of monitoring people, governments controlling cyber networks, surveillance systems, and algorithms. So some observers call it as a techno authoritarian superpower. So at an international level, Asia Pacific countries such as Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan are trying to be a rule maker by actively creating FTAs, these digital chapters, or ambitious digital trade or digital economy agreements. So this approach is broadly in line with the US FTA approach, which is market-driven and innovation-focused. Um, from the economic strategy point of view, so the data trading data is extremely important for the UK. More than half of UK service exports and imports are delivered digitally. UK business had a strong interest in making policy network with the Asian Pacific countries, given the growing digital market there. In the policy realm, the UK government's ambition is to become global data hub. So the UK government published national data strategy last December, as you might know. Um, there, championing the international flow of data is set as one of the five missions. So the government is trying to use FTA and the digital agreement to pursue that mission. Also, it aims to build trust in the use of data and to facilitate cross-border data flows. However, practical solution to achieve the aspiration or to resolve emerging trade-offs are not explained. Uh, we have to note last Friday, the UK government has launched reforming UK's data protection regime which is currently built on the GDPR. The government explained this is the first step in delivering one of the missions listed on the national data strategy, that is to secure a pro-growth and a trusted data regime. 
it is crucial to see whether the movement is a sign of departing from the EU's approach towards the Asia Pacific established governance based on the market driven approach. So in the briefing paper, um, we compared five of the most recent digital trade agreements, um, EU, the EU-UK Trade Cooperation Agreement, TCA, and the UK-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, CEPA, CPTPP, the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement, and the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement, that's its new NAFTA, so I call it USMCA to identify UK's policy tendency of shifting away from EU digital governance. So we included the Australia-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement because the UK has agreed the FTA with Australia, um, although the full text is not yet available. And Singapore will become, is likely to become UK's first partner of digital economy agreement. As for the MCA, uh, since the UK desires to have a trade deal with the US, um, USMCA is a way to understand US approach, especially maybe now the ambition is done ready to work what, uh, realistically to achieve this uh, trade deal, um, apparently. So the paper focusing on the three aspects. So one, how can the UK strike the right balance between the economic gains from free data flows, such as ban on data localization, ban on disclosure source code, and so on, and the public policy objectives, such as data privacy, cyber security, and uh, especially under the TCA, more specifically defined, such as safety, health, social education, environment, public morale. And the second point is how the UK enable the cross-border data flow while making high standard of data protection. So relating to this, how can the UK ensure regulatory interoperability among FTA partners with different data protection regimes? Thirdly, can the UK accept the non-discrimination principle for digital product, <clears throat> which the UK does not insert in its FTA digital trade chapters? This table shows the comparison study on these three aspects. The colors indicate the strengths of the policy stance. That is, as the lighter the blue shading, the lower the degree of government safeguarding, and the more the approach to data privacy leans towards a self-regulatory regime. We found the two strong features from the comparison study of these five agreements. First, the degree of consideration for public policy space in the provisions regarding free data flow requirement, bound on data localization, and about disclosure source code under TCA is the highest, and the one under USMC is the lowest. As you can see, um, the blue shading becomes lighter as you go to the right direction. Um, the TCA has a strong general provision in comparison with the WTO regarding right to regulate and exceptions that apply to all provision in the digital chapter in the first place. Based on these general clauses, detailed safeguarding clauses provided case by case. So in contrast, other flow agreements take WTO approach of general exceptions to safeguard public policy objectives. SEPA basically copy the provision under CPTPP, the degree of safeguarding public policies slightly higher than that of CPTPP. Likewise, the Australia Singapore DA basically copied CPTPP, although it's shifted more towards market-oriented approach with less government intervention for public policy objectives. USMCA is an FTA that tries to minimize government intervention for public policy objectives. The second finding is that the level of government's commitment to personal data and privacy protection under the TCA is the highest. The way in which data privacy is treated has to be examined in relation with the free data flow requirement. Under the TCA, Protection data, uh, personal data and privacy, what set as condition cross-border data transfers. 
Um, generally, the U.S. sets adequate sedition as a condition of free labor flow on the on FTA. So SEPA is an interesting case. Uh, the UK and Japan accorded adequacy decision to each other outside the agreement. So while CPTPP sets strong priority for free data flows, its provision of personal data and privacy is weak as it only recommends to take into account the principles and the guidelines of relevant international bodies without any specific reference. The Austria Singapore DEA is basically saying a CPTPP's provision on personal data and privacy, but it goes further towards business driven system. For example, it recognizes APIC cross border privacy rules, which promote self regulatory regime as a valid system. So it should be noted that the level of private data protection under APIC cross border privacy rule is lower than that of the GDPR. Um, so what are challenges for the UK to join the CPTPP in the field of digital trade? First of all, um, we have to understand that joining CPTPP is different from negotiating new FTA. The CPTPP accession rule requires full compliance with the CPTPP rules as a condition of becoming a member. The UK has to demonstrate that UK domestic laws and regulation can comply with the obligation of the CPTPP. As Emily mentioned, there is a way to derogate from a certain legal obligation in practice, but it is understood that CPTPP members' expectation to comply with the CPTPP rule is very high. Um, so this is because the UK is the first accepting country and the second UK is a highly developed open economy. CPTPP members are afraid that allowing many derogation would downgrade its role to the outset level. And the outset is a, that, that, that level, the rule is narrower and shallower than that of the CPTPP. So they want to differentiate. So we have found the three challenges from the comparison analysis, which I explained. The first challenge is a balance between free data flow and the public policy objectives. Under the CPTPP, public policy space in the provision regarding data localization and disclosure source code is narrower than SIPA, for example. It is acceptable for all stakeholders, especially non-business stakeholders, such as consumers and the civil society, to just narrowing the level of the public policy space. The second challenge is notably important. How can the UK maintain high standards of personal data protection while ensuring free cross-border data flow with CPTP members under the CPTP rules? Is there any possible mechanism to ensure interoperability with CPTP members without lowering UK's high standard of data privacy? It should be noted that only three countries Canada, Japan, and New Zealand out of 11 CPTPP countries have received an adequate citizen from the EU. This indicates that the level of protection personal data and privacy in other eight countries is lower than the GDPR level. Relating to this, potential negative impact on EU's adequacy decision for the UK cannot be ignored. The current adequacy decision has a four year sunset clause and is not permanent, unfortunately. Not only it gets divergence from GDPR, but any future moves for onward transfer of personal data from the UK to third countries are taking into account the renewal of the EU's decision. The third challenge is about non discriminatory treatment provision. CPTPP is likely to become the first FTA for the UK to accept the non-discriminatory treatment of digital products under an FTA. Neither TCL or SIPA somehow do not include this basic principle. A change of position would be carefully analyzed together with the scope of the principle. So the conclusion is, um, as follows. 
So every country is facing challenges in formulating digital trade policy as data governance is technically complex and the environment surrounding digital trade and data is rapidly changing. Digital trade and data influence not only business, but also consumers, workers, and their citizens. In addition, data governance encompasses a wide range of policy areas, um, including consumer protection policy, industrial policy, con uh, competition policy, intellectual property rights, cyber security, and human rights, and so on. So the digital chapter is an is in an FTA, cannot be detached from other public policy. Digital trade provision in a new FTA, such as CPTPP, are likely to constrain domestic policy and impact UK society and influence the UK's future FTA or digital trade agreements. So I'd like to emphasize that rather than concluding digital chapters in its FTA one by one, first, the UK has to establish its cross-cutting digital trade strategy, which would publicly set out the UK's regulatory objectives and clearly explain ways and mechanisms to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Miliko. Um, let me hand over straight away to David for his thoughts and comments on a fairly challenging and broad set of issues that have been raised there. Over to you, David. Thank you, Michael. A pleasure to be uh, invited. And I think my role as a discussant is to put forward a slightly different view on the, the issue. So um, unfortunately, that means I won't be delving deep into the technical uh, issues around chlorinated chicken. I hope that won't disappoint you too much. Um, let me instead draw on um, some experience of studying regulation and trade over, over many years to to offer five points and suggest four actions. And I think these will be slightly different to, uh, to, to, to those we've heard so far. So the first one would be this, regulation in trade agreements is actually still fairly new and actually largely untested. The SPS and TBT commitments in WTO date back to 1995, but we haven't really moved on markedly from that. We've seen sectoral annexes, mutual recognition agreements, dialogue, but essentially we still don't really know how effective any of these are. We're still struggling to measure the cost of regulatory dif difference. We're still struggling to really understand how to, how, to, how to reduce barriers to trade or how effective each of these pieces of text is in actually facilitating trade. Um, the follow on point from that, then, is that the individual provisions in free trade agreements, including in the CPTPP, that touch on regulations remain ambiguous. And I think that Emily and Minaka have, have, have brought this out um, quite well um, in, in food and drink as, as much as, as, in, uh, as in digital. If we look at the text of the CPTPP, it is indeed different to, uh, to that of the, uh, the EU. Um, in food and drink, it mentions science. Um, but we don't actually know that that would allow the UK to continue to prohibit Australian hormone treated beef. Um, both measures, as I think Emily mentioned, are exempted from dispute settlement to recognise equivalence and to base their measures on science. Um, then there's emerging issues coming up like animal welfare. Well, that's not in the text at all. We just don't know uh, what would happen if a, if a member tried to, of CPTPP tried to introduce that. Um, now, I suspect in the past, free trade agreements have not made that much difference on regulatory issues, but that might change. Even on the precautionary approach, I'm not sure I quite agree that the US has such an objection to it, um, at least in theory. In practice, they certainly have had objections to the way it's been implemented, prohibiting their food. But then if we want to, uh, to get a little bit picky with regard to the US, we could ask for their scientific justification for the ban on haggis. Uh, it isn't one that I've ever found. Um, so that's, uh, that's more on food and drink. Uh, on digital provisions, they're even more untested. Um, and we're not really hearing from business now that the provisions in trade agreements allow them to do something they were prohibited from do it, prevented from doing before. Um, that data is suddenly flowing and it wasn't before. 
um, or that the cost of business is being changed, it seems likely that provisions are there mostly at the moment as a reassurance um, or even a marker. Um, and even then, the digital chapter in CPTPP is full of language that says something along the lines of nothing in this article shall preclude or prevent. So there's a lot of caveats even there. And I think I'd go on further on digital to the fourth point that in particular, we don't seem to know what we want from regulation. We is a very collective global we there. Um, there was quite a perceptive blog um, by Simon Lester and Huan Zhu, or then of Cato in February this year, um, which suggested that, and sorry, I'm reading out a quote here. Currently, we're at about the same stage on data flows that we were for trade in goods before World War II. At the time, there were a number of bilateral trade agreements dealing with goods, but no comprehensive multilateral rules. The nuances of the rules were only sorted out after decades of experience with discussions and disputes at the GATT and then the World Trade Organization, its, success, its successor organization. Ultimately, if there is to be a coherent set of multilateral rules, then all the major players will have to sit down and work out a compromise. So in other words, we've got a lot of um, clauses around digital trade, but we don't really know what it is that they are meant to deliver or whether they're going to deliver or whether they are going to uh, withstand scrutiny um, once they actually may prov provide obstacles to trade. Um, and the balance between data flows and protections, between source code and government rights and so on. We're putting uh, things that we don't really know into, into treaty, which is quite a bold thing to do in a way. Um, final point on a, along the line, further lines of we don't really understand as much as we should. Regulation has become a major function of government. It has a direct relationship to trade, yet we don't really understand this sufficiently. And we can evidence that via the Northern Ireland Protocol, for example, over the last five years, or even in, in the last few minutes, uh, Lord Frost has been standing up in the UK Parliament saying, I'm going to repeal, or we're looking to re repeal some, reg some regulations. He mentions car standards among it. Car standards are set internationally by and large by uh, UNECE. Um, so it's not clear there's a very good understanding generally in government of regulations and how they interact with trade. Then we have tensions with, uh, devolution, for, ex for example, um, we, have, we, we have tensions with domestic uh, requ requirements. These are all complex questions, not easily resolvable when you're not really having a, a debate. And I think it's the complex ecosystem around domestic and international regulation, their impact on inter international trade, that explains why regulatory provisions in trade agreements are a bit immature. Um, that we're trying to enshrine the balance of national regulation and international trade in treaty, have been doing so since 1995, and that is incredibly difficult. Um, so if those are the reflections and other, along the lines of however complex it seemed when Emily and Minaka were pre pre presenting, it's actually even more complicated in my view, what would then be the recommendations that I, that I, that I would uh, see coming out of this? And I think the first one is, would be very different to that presented so far. I think there's a strong case for signing up to CPTPP and not worrying too much about the exact provisions, unless we're required to specify more than is already the case. In other words, side letters on interpretation of um, how we're interpreting the SPS clauses shouldn't actually be, ne be necessary. Now, if we're asked, to in, demanded that we, we sign up to hormone treated beef. That's another matter. But I suspect this is all going to be an ongoing negotiation. Um, all FTAs are in some degree ongoing discussions around, uh, particularly around food and drink. Um, they just provide a, a, a higher platform if you like to do it. With the US, that would be different. With the US involved, they clearly, that's a big issue for them is to make sure that they can get their products on sale, their hormone treated beef, their chlorinated chicken. That's not the case with CPTP members, some of whom are already not necessarily adhering fully to the uh, to the text. Similarly, on the digital, um, they look OK, these provisions, but they may not last the test of, of time. Um, also, that also means the other way around. They may not deliver that much for UK companies who hope they, they would. Um, 
but certainly it is worth probing the UK government to see what they would do. But I'm I'm less worried on these areas of, as, as to signing up. Now, if, as is strongly rumoured, China is about to put in a formal application to join the CPTPP, then we, w- we might need to see whether the uh, member countries will want a um, rather more robust process. And then we may need to revisit this. Um, I'm slightly in danger of running over time, so I'm going to make the others uh, quicker. The other um, thoughts I have, recommendations. Second one would be to keep very high standards in the UK anyway and make the establishment of trust a key UK objective. This goes against the deregulation narrative. But if you're buying from the UK, it strikes me that you're buying trust and you're buying high quality. You're not aiming to buy uh, low quality. The deregulation agenda seems to be out of, out of date. Um, keep developing all our thinking on regulations and trade. We don't have all the answers now. Um, we should think more in, in much more detail. The UK has the opportunity to do so. I think we've wasted it so far, but we can really, uh, you know, we really should pick up that conversation again. What do we want? How do we want to balance regulations and trade? And final thought, I've always thought that in terms of regulations and trade, the most important thing we should be pushing for is a principle in the WTO, that of non-discrimination. We should accept that different countries will regulate in different ways, but that they shouldn't be regulating in such a way as to be obviously discriminatory against uh, an individual country. That's a WTO principle. I think we should uh, extend it and make it uh, make make it a part of what we push for as well. Um, so, you know, that that at least would give us something to to, to hang on to while we review our uh, policies on on regulations and trade. But it is a fundamentally complex topic. I've been working on it and researching it now for 12 years, and I still don't have a full handle on it. Um, yeah, these papers are really useful contributions to uh, to the debate, uh, but I, and I fear the debate has to, to carry on because we don't have the full answers yet. With that, Michael, I'll pass back to you. Many, many thanks, David. Very interesting. So I'm going to just briefly turn back to Minico and Emily to see if they have any immediate brief comments to any of what you've said. But let me actually link that to the first question that we've got in the Q&A, which in a way you've given your answer to, a partial answer to, David. This is a question from Ed Farmer about, uh, which is, if the UK EU FDA does not work, does this have to be canned for us then to be able to do FDAs around the world? One reading or my reading of your comments, David, is no, that it's perfectly possible to sign up to CPTPP and you seem pretty relaxed about that and maintaining our agreement with the EU. That may not be the case for a UK-US agreement, but let's leave that to one side. So with that in mind, does Emily or Minika, do either of you want to just respond to anything that David has said? Emily first. So, I mean, I hope I reflected a certain sort of agnosticism about what these provisions actually mean in practice. And I think CPTPP is full of experiments in regulatory cooperation in in various areas. Um, But I think that we could extend that one step further and say, well, what determines how these will work in practice? And again, this is in a sense restating what, what, what you have said, I think which is, well, it depends how much particular trade partners, A, want to sort of weaponize these provisions, uh, B, what kind of leverage they have to do so, um, and C, you know, how the regulating country responds based on whatever its internal politics are. So if we take that scenario and sort of plug it into this question about you know, um, Northern Ireland and whether there's a, an and or a dichotomy, between having regulatory alignment with the EU on agri-food and having all of our other FTAs? I think the answer is it depends on, first of all, what the EU thinks about whether that's possible and what its uh, internal politics are there. And second of all, what CPTPP members think about and whether they care about UK SPS <laughs> regulation. So it's very contingent on politics, not law. And, um, and I do agree that theoretically you can, you know, you can you can coexist in both spaces. And indeed, let's keep in mind there are plenty of countries like New Zealand um, who are in CPTPP um, and you know trade 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 with the U.S. and and the EU. So, um, so I think it's it's possible, but but it's you know politically um, contingent. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Minico. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much, David, for your um, insights. I very much appreciate it. Um, I'd like to just uh, give the three points responding to David's um, uh, uh, thought. First of all, I just well, the, um, I'm just thinking about you know the UK's FTAs. It's uh, what I'd like to outline as a really underline is that UK what the UK is doing, trying to achieve is deep FTAs, deep FTAs, which is completely different from the you know uh, the kind of conventional type of FTAs, uh, more focusing on the tariff issues and the more the coverage is wider and the rules is much deeper. So what does it mean? So that's related to the, my second point. So the, uh, and then this is really the why I just try to look at, I'm a trade expert, you are the more trade expert, I'm also a trade expert. So I'm always trying to understand from the trade policy text, you know, context, but uh, we have to just change that dimension after each division, uh, each whether each chapter has completely different, very strong, heavy policy message there. So this is one thing I really have to, we have to think about from the involvement of the non-trade expert is really getting more important. And um, so the, and the second point, as David said, well, the digital, well, provident still untested. Yes, this is true because um, the policy makers really now well, the well learning by doing, and then try to understand what is going on, what we should do, what we should do. Uh, so yes, untested, and then but in the in the context of the FTAs, the FTA is a country, a country is trying to promote economic diplomacy, mainly economic diplomacy. But the data data is beyond economic diplomacy. This is my point. And then when I look at the um, UK's you know, FTA negotiation, I think the business interest is very, the echoes, the, the voice of the business interest, not regarding the EU, UK, but uh, you know, the, with regard to the Asia Pacific region, the more that the government is trying to listen to the business stakeholders point of view, because market, market-based market. So that's the emphasis. Um, but, the data is really relating to more for the consumers, users, they, well, the pri well, well, the three kind of data here is a private data and the public data and then as business data. So this um, private data is really the kind of the key. We, we don't know that the data is, uh, you know, when data cross the border, whose data becomes public in the hood data becomes about business and big data from some point and so on. So many technical issues we don't know. But then, then the concern for the long-term point is that is relating to the you know, trust, building trust. But then, you know, business stake, non-business stakeholders voice is really important for the long-term economic prosperity at the global level. This is the second thing, untested, but we really have to be careful what the FTA Minika, is. just be quick with your third thing right. I want the to third, open up yes, discussion. <laughs> the third point is, I have to be very quick. Uh, so so the David point says, well, we don't know what they are, what we are doing in the free trade, well, the, 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 the trade problem in FTAs, for example. But uh, yes, they know, I think so. Because that the data is a key and the data driven economy is economy each country would like to be. And then this is a kind of battleground. And then how to do it, they have to try to give a different approach. And then, so I don't think that from the UK is very in a unique position, but it's, I, my question is jumping into the CPTPP template, is it really the way for the UK? So this is really that they have that the UK can have their, its own template based on what it has. So I stop here, thank you. Thank you, Minico. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me now turn to the questions from the uh, participants here. Um, the second question I want to turn to is from Patrick, Patrick Killeran, and this is a question directly for Emily, which is, how does the UK joining CPTPP intersect with the recommendations from the Trade and Agriculture Commission and the National Food Strategy around imposing core import standards stroke dual tariffs on imported agricultural food products. 
So I would put that question on on Defra's desk. I mean, we we have this all this momentum uh, from from the the food national food strategy and the TAC about how we should have um, core uh, standards. We should have core standards that would constitute our strategy in the agri food um, environment area. But the government hasn't responded to that um, that that those recommendations yet. So we don't really know whether and how they will play in um, to the to the UK's trade strategy at all. Um, if that recommendation is accepted, then presumably we would have some sort of iteration of core standards, which we would then hold up to various trade agreements. And then that just plunges us back into all the ambiguities about what these provisions really mean. So um, it, it would certainly be useful in clarifying our domestic strategy, but it's something that hasn't been embraced um, by the government. Thank you, Emily. Let me turn to Patrick's second question, which is for the whole panel, and I'll invite either David or Minico to answer uh, first on this, is in terms of UK government deal sequencing, do you think CPTPP is a purposeful stepping stone toward the UK-USA FTA? I, 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 I would say it was actually part of the, the UK government's plan initially that Perhaps CPTPP would be a halfway house to a US trade deal. It would soften people up on food standards issues. Um, I think the changes in the way the US is looking at trade policy have kind of changed that uh, equation. And that instead of the US now being the US trade deal now being the big uh, prize, the CPTPP is now seen as the big uh, as the big prize. So. Um, I think that was the case, but I don't think it is at the moment, because at the moment, the US doesn't really have a trade policy. And if it did, um, it's hard to know what it would be in it. Yeah, I thought it was interesting just to sort of follow up on that again on Liz Truss's speech of two days ago about you know trade policy going forward for the UK. An agreement with the US wasn't even mentioned. The US wasn't even mentioned as part of that entire speech. Anyway, Minico, what would be your answer to that question? Yeah, just the one thing is, I, I put political, well, political landscape, but I completely agree with David. Just a more technical thing is, well, then how about the digital trade provision? And so, you know, the, the, I might understand my wrong, but about the UK government trying to um, make kind of digital trade agreement with the US. And if that is the case, maybe the CPTPP might become the kind of the bottom line of the template and how far they can go with the starting from the CPTPP. Thank you. So next question is from an anonymous attendee, which is what other CPTPP countries don't hear, adhere to the agreement and how? And I guess that's probably picking up on something that David said. Uh, <laughs> Look, I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because it would to be something I was um, told in, uh, in in a reasonable amount of confidence. But um, right. yeah, there, let us just say that while that on we are not the only country which has controversy over whether, in theory, it would allow U.S. food into the into the country or not, and that there is, um, you know. <laughs> Other 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 countries were also concerned about the uh, about the implications of the the SPS chapters on on, on it. So it is related to, uh, to 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 SPS. Now I've not delved into the detail of exactly how this all works, and one of the goes back to the question of exactly how do SPS uh, sex, uh, chapters work in reality. But um, we wouldn't be the only country with some uh, question marks. Okay, thank you, David. Emily wants um, to be on that, I think. Emily, I just yes. did jump in because I thought maybe it might be a question about side letters, although I'm not totally sure. But just to say something quickly on, on side letters, when, when, the, when the US left the agreement, there was um, a, a bit of a shakeup. And one of the elements of the post-US CP TPP is that countries decided that they wanted to opt out of certain elements. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at these side letters when I was writing this briefing paper, and they're very, they, they cover a wide range of issues. So opting out of um, investor state dispute settlement is a big one, but there's also, you know, Canada saying we don't want to liberalize our, um, you know, our film sector um, and television programs. And then there's Japan saying, well, here's our specific rice quotas. So all kinds of little uh, bugbears uh, that the 
individual countries have where they say we don't want to follow these particular rules and some of them are just bilateral and some of them are agreed with all the members so there's there is some a lot, quite a lot of flexibility in that space i i think okay thank you um right it's 29 minutes past one we have one minute left which is not very long so i'm not going to take any more questions can i just go around all of the panelists david emily and minico in that order to see if you have any final brief comments uh, no, it's an excellent discussion. We need to have more discussions on on regulations and tr and, uh, and and trade to, to learn more about how all of this works in theory and indeed in practice. And I welcome any contributions from uh, members of the audience as well. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think if there's one takeaway, it's that we have to figure out what we're doing domestically and then and then decide how that slots into trade agreements. But I just hope that people come away from this feeling less confused than they were when we started, although I'm not positive that will be the case. <laughs> Thank you. Milenko. Yes. Now, um, well, FTA, as I said, is very deep, deep FTA, so that uh, well, there are so many issues to discuss. The one example is really data, this uh, trading data is really the, becoming the key after trade policy area. So that I we really need more, you know, the, the analysis and discussion with the many stakeholders in this field. Thank you very much, Minako. That's great. And thank you very much to all three of you. Fascinating and interesting. Let me just say a couple of things to, to finish off with. The first thing, and this goes back to the discussion, in a sense, what central to what we've been talking about over the past hour, I guess, is the extent to which you can coexist in different FTAs and what you sign up to in different FTAs. And it is true that we need to understand this better and to investigate this better. I think you can coexist across different FTAs, clearly you can, but there may be consequences. And it's really trying to unpick and understand those consequences. So I'm not as relaxed as David, for example, on let's just join up to CPTPP, because I think on the data provision side, it could have longer term implications for an adequacy decision between the UK and the EU. So I think one does need to be a little bit concerned about those sorts of issues. So I, I would mention that. I also think that as a generic point, not specifically to do with the CPTPP, the extent to which this there may be consequences, which could be bilateral between the country signing or because of your agreements with third countries, will I think depend on the strengths of the dispute settlement provisions as well. So the extent to which regulations matter is also going to be closely related. Well, if you contravene what you signed up to, what are the consequences? And therefore these discussions need to take that on board. But on that note, I should stop speaking, stop rabbiting on. Thank you everybody enormously for attending. Thank you to the participants. Both briefing papers are available on the UK Trade Policy Observatory website. If you're interested in these issues, you want to see more details, please feel free to download the briefing papers, read the briefing papers, and contact the authors if you have any more questions. Look forward to seeing you at future, w, uh, future UK TPO webinars, and thank you very much, everybody, once again. And bye-bye. <laughs>